Hello and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm trying to inject as much enthusiasm into that introduction as Joe manages because it's just me today, Alex. I am delighted to welcome uh, as my guest the Telegraph's JJ Bull. JJ, hello. Hello, Alex. I'll bring the energy. I'll bring the thunder. Here we go. You ready? <laughs> That is that's that's quite a lot. Yeah, no, that's it, it, that's it might that's subside. Great. Don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> it's uh, yes, JJ is is sort of like uh, for those of you who don't know, and you really should. He's like me if I was Scottish and nice, um, <laughs> but but I'm well, I'm quarter Scottish anyway. An effervescent, an effervescent version. <laughs> yes, exactly that. So Annoying. we're going to be going through some uh, tactical trends from uh, the Premier League and potentially further afield in this episode. Um, but before we do that, another trend that everyone should be following, yes, it's one of those really shoehorn segues, is to subscribe to The Athletic, which is the best place to get all manner of not just football uh, content, but general sports content. So if you like NBA, NFL, ice hockey, NASCAR. I'm sure some of you out there love a bit of NASCAR. Uh, you can subscribe to The Athletic for £1 a week currently on a kind of introductory offer thing uh, at uh, theathletic.com forward slash TIFO. And I would heartily encourage you to do that as much as I would heartily ever do anything. So without further ado, um, I will leave you in the cool hands and the warm embrace of myself and JJ Bull. JJ, this has been a relatively helter-skelter season so far. We've had fixtures that have produced results that were uh, pretty wildly unexpected, at least two of them involving Aston Villa. But we think between ourselves and our little sort of cabal of, of tactics nerds that there are a couple of themes um, that we can sort of pull out from the season so far. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, as host, this is my prerogative, I'm just going to throw it to you, JJ, and I'm going to say, tell me about one of these trends uh, and and then we can, you know, discuss it further. Great. Well, one of these trends, I believe, is that every single team seems to be employing something like a, a back three, a three-man defensive system. And some of them are featuring overlapping centre-backs. And uh, yeah, I think we should start with that and look at why that's happened. Well, this has obviously been a significant... I mean, the back three seem to kind of come into vogue when Antonio Conte brought it to Chelsea to, you know, win the title out of uh, that that defeat to Arsenal where he was using a back four. But we've we've gradually now, particularly with uh, Sheffield United achieving promotion with it, Brighton starting to use it quite a lot, Wolves obviously the same. Um, most oddly to me, actually, West Ham now, which is not, you know, necessarily the sort of innovation I would have associated with David Moyes, although I think Moyes gets unfair criticism with his abilities. So wh why do you think teams are using, if you can generalise, because, you know, obviously different teams use it for different reasons, but what's the general thinking behind using a back three? It's, uh, I think it's interesting how, when Conte brought it in, it's because he saw too many defensive vulnerabilities. So he wanted to to make Chelsea harder to to beat, right? That's the first thing you want to do. If you don't concede, you've got a better chance of winning a game. So by bringing that in, and the thing with like three-man defensive systems, you've got, like, like West Ham, you're saying, is a 5-4 one out of possession, and in possession, it's kind of a 3-2-5 if the wing-backs can get forward quick enough, but mostly a 5-2-3. And that's something that I think even Leon were doing last year. Uh, was it last year they were playing against Man City in the Champions League? Maybe the seasons before. Yeah, that's right. With uh, Corne yeah. on the right, on was he on the right hand or the left hand side? But yeah, he it was sort of getting that impetus forward from the wide positions and allowing the forward players to tuck in a little bit more. Like there's a there's a few different ways to play it, and I, I mean, you look at the the kind of the most famous version of it. I think would be Cruyff's kind of Barcelona template where he had a I think it was a three four three. You can maybe see it's a three one three three or something like that, but. 
and that was all very possession based, high pressing, uh, lots of passes, clever movement, very fluid. And then you've got even in Scotland now, I think you've got Livingston playing a three one three three, but they're doing it with the most long balls in the entire division. So two shapes similar, completely different ways of playing it, uh, very different results. <laughs> but that depends on the players you've got in. It, I, and I wonder whether it depends on the players you have as well, whether that's just the way to do it. Conte has definitely changed this in the Premier League. And a, a particular note is that he started it against Arsenal because uh, Arsenal, by the end of that same season, had started playing the same system. It, it sort of crept in everywhere it just spread to all different managers even Arsene Wenger who notoriously never really changed his tactical setup from game to game did based on what his players were telling them I wonder whether I mean that point about players I think is is absolutely right and I you know it's it's always a, a difficulty if you see managers trying to shoehorn players into their favoured systems and the players clearly are, are suited to another one and obviously this is an issue that you get when when managers take over at teams it seems to me that that one of the key points is, and I you know agree or disagree as as you see fit, but because because central midfield now is is such a congested area and teams are regularly either seeking to play with three across midfield or if they've got a three at the back, then the wing backs are tucking inside in and adding additional bodies to that area. That one of the benefits of a three is that you can have a player, whether it's a David Luiz uh, or a Connor Cody who can sit in the middle of that back three, who is a little bit more protected from their defensive duties, but also is able to pick a pass because they maybe only have one or two players who are trying to press them and close them down. And obviously there are are passing options to the goalkeeper or the other centre-backs. And it's a way of teams facilitating a a build-up that bypasses midfield because midfield is becoming so crowded as as players get fitter and better at pressing and so on if you have a player like louise it it sounds a little bit like i don't watch an awful lot of it or any of american football we have a quarterback you often see people refer to them as quarterback players but you need to put your players who can best play the ball into space now if you have midfielders who are best at i don't know blocking making short passes maybe not you know players like granite Xhaka, that kind of thing at arsenal and then you have a player with louise's passing ability in space because they're further back it gives you options also if you play a back three one of your midfielders drops in the form of diamond and like diamonds are king in football right you you make diamonds all over the pitch it's what you want to do because it gives you passing lanes passing options and it's very easy to move around so with your three you can be quite progressive you've got your diamond but then if you're really defensive you put two midfielders in so you you have options either side and you form a diamond on each flank but it's all designed to get the player who can distribute it quickly with the ball and if you have players playing against you in a high press and you've got a player who can hit it suddenly the player in space who can create is the defender so you need a player like Luis, and then you need a player who can get in space higher up the pitch you can possibly beat the high line everything's cyclical in football right so it must be a response to what other teams were doing but now we'll probably see a response to to three-man defenses coming in another way and I, I wonder what that is and what it was last time actually I'm not sure yeah, well, I mean, I guess one of the one of the ways is that I mean, well, partly I, I agree on the cyclical nature, but I think the increase of pressing will change the answer from what the answer was last time, yeah. um, which probably was, I'm guessing, you know, players who were able to pass the ball out of the back, like a Ronald Kerman, for example, would have been relatively more unusual at that point in time. I think players now are more capable and we we see very very technical central defenders capable of of long ranges of passing in a back four as well um but i do wonder whether you know that the idea of 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 squeezing out that sort of that central almost sweeper libero type of player who generally i think is is less inclined to carry the ball forwards i mean luis does that a bit but someone like cody He's not really carrying it. He's he's sitting back in the pocket, like you say, like a quarterback, and and hitting those long passes. And it was it was something that he was doing very ably for England as well, actually. Mm. Um, whether the the kind of you know the the one of the primary roles of strikers becomes being able to press that consistently, and you know the kind of Danny Ings where or Che Adams for Southampton, where they are, yes, they're strikers, they're goal scorers, and their job is to be in the box to, to receive possession. 
but also a significant element of what they do is pressing. Uh, and the opportunity to, to squeeze teams at the back, try and cut that off. Because if you can't then progress the ball to midfield, you can't do anything with it. Um, and I, I think it also dovetails with this idea that some midfields are becoming a lot less about ball progression and a lot more about blocking, pressing, cutting opportunities off and then shuttling it a little bit. I think you see that especially with Liverpool, whose midfield is basically that. Players who can just sort of keep the ball, not maybe... Like if you look at players like Fabinho and Wijnaldum, sure they can play, but I think most of the responsibility is to almost protect the people behind them and let the players ahead of them do more work. I think looking at Arsenal is quite interesting with how Arteta's doing it because his setup is so defensive, so rigid, so highly structured. Like, cause, I mean, the first reason they brought in that three-four-three was to try and um, make them defensively solid. Like you know, we all know that, but. The players he has available, are they the right fit for it? He's playing Kieran, Kieran Tierney, who is a left-back. He played wing-back under Rodgers at Celtic for a bit, and he's good there. He's good going forward, but he's a full-back, really. And you get a lot of players now who, the, the modern full-backs, like Andy Robertson, people like that, who have the engine to run up and down the wing. So if you have a player who can do that, it means you can put a player elsewhere on the pitch. So you can have a, a, a winger who's actually another forward. So rather than playing one striker, you're effectively playing kind of three if you have wing backs going up alongside them, if that makes sense. So the problem with, like, with Arsenal, the way they do it, is uh, you have Tierney often as a left centre-back, not a wing back. So that this uh, another trend, I suppose, is part of this um, three-man thing is that the, these overlapping centre-backs that Sheffield United made very famous. You've got play, a lot of teams playing their full-backs at centre-back so they can then have an additional overlapping run, or underlapping, just a bit of unpredictability going forward. Man United are doing it, Luke Shaw. Mm. You've got, uh, I mean... England did it in the World Cup with Carl Walker quite successfully. Yeah, I mean, that's based on um, Man City doing it with Walker. Because Walker's a full-back, but he's not really anymore. He's a... Auxiliary centre back. I wonder what the term for that football manager will be now. <laughs> a full back who goes and becomes a centre back. A dynamic centre back, maybe. Oh, I, that's quite good. Yeah. It's not. It's not. I, I'm not settled on it though. We'll come no. up with it. Yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to work out what it is. But yeah, and it all depends on the players you've got. But you have with Arsenal system by having the, an extra d- defensive player, you lose obviously another player further up the pitch, and then what they end up having is that. Like Lacazette for them as a as a nine is essentially dropping into midfield because mm. they're short of a man in midfield. <laughs> and then they've got two wide forwards who have to stay wide with no focal point in attack to push the defence back and nothing happens, so they don't create. Yeah. So they're blocking everyone and the, the system works that way, but there's nothing going forward. And I think you want to have something like how... Like the way Newcastle work it and the way like Leon worked it is you... Because I associate three-man defences normally in, in the past with like bad teams use them. <laughs> Yeah, so so if you're a bad team, you've got more chance of getting a result because you've you got loads of bodies in the way. You can block in midfield, and then you hit the teams on the counter as they inevitably open up to try and break you down, and then you get those goals, and then you just do the same thing again. You've got the advantage of the counter attack. Like West Ham have been um, phenomenal in the counter attack this season. That's where their most of their wins have come from. Newcastle last season were very good at doing that in the counter attack because they had players that were unpredictable and they could they could do that. But Arsenal are trying to play a possession game that they've made, I think it's the third most passes in the league this season. And they've had, I think it's the 13th most shots. It's not possession with purpose. There's no there's lack of penetration. And that's the thing that I think is, I don't find it very fun to watch. Really. No, no, it's, it's, it's not. And it, you know, it, it goes back again to this thing of, I guess this brings me to my next point, actually. So obviously Arsenal have got a player like Ozil in the squad. They've also got, more unpredictable players, people like um, Joe Willock, uh, who are interesting. They let Alex Iwobi go, but he was that kind of dynamic ball carrier who could who could do something a little bit different. You've done some coaching badges. So if you put yourself in the position of a manager like Arteta at Arsenal, are you thinking to yourself, I have a system that I want to play, and I'm going to adapt and assume I'm given enough time to use transfer windows to be able to shape the squad more to my liking to fit that system? Or do you think, 
actually the most sensible thing to do here is to assess the various players that I've got, look at what they're good and bad at, and then create a system that works for them. This, to me, is kind of like the perennial football manager conundrum of <laughs> do, do yeah. I want to play the system that I love and always play and then and then work around it or do I look at the squad and what they can do and, and pick on that basis well I mean to start to point out my, my coaching badges are very very low uh, grade <laughs> I'm not yet on a C license not even a C license yet but you can uh, still answer the question <laughs> no. that's fine um I think so. This is something I've been looking at, and I think we talked about it last time it was on the, in the podcast. How it takes a long time to to build a team. And it was at Rennie Muhlenstein, the old Man United first team coach, um, told me he thinks it's eighteen months for you to go in and start to see the progression of what you're doing. Now, if we look at with Arteta at, at Arsenal, the, the the players that he inherited seem to have been signed to suit a back three. They have a heap of central defenders. Um, they don't really have wingers, do they? Because they brought Willian in. I'm trying to think they had Saka. They bought Pepe. But Pepe was always playing in a counter-attack 4-4-2 team, yeah. which they were never going to play. And it's it's not quite working for him because a player like that, you see the same with like James Rodriguez. The players who affect the play most in the, th- the final third and are creative just don't maybe do enough defensively. They don't see things that players who are defensive do. It's not that they're lazy or they're not trying. It's just that they don't see things they don't recognize danger when they need to things like that so when Arteta goes in he, I think he first of all he started with a 4 2 3 one, was his first system uh, same principles all the way through he wants to get the ball from uh, back to front as quickly as possible you see it in coaching um, in his there's little training videos that you see him doing and he can, the, the passing thing he's telling them to do is he doesn't want the short sideways he wants it vertical so you get the ball to the furthest person as quickly as you can and if you've got three center backs and you've got people up front there should be someone available that can lay it back and if you've got Lacazette so Lacazette drops in as a a false nine and you've got two forwards either side of him the ball can go to the furthest man into Lacazette and then you've got a a further runner and you should be able to build from there it's not as easy as simple as that but the first thing Arteta wanted to do was stop losing games because to have the time to build your team you need to avoid being relegated (laughs) or just having the fans turn on you making your team weak it's all about confidence so if you win games, you should have more confidence. To avoid losing games, you need to not concede goals. The first thing he did is revert to a, a 3-4-3 that I think well, Wenger introduced. I think Emery played it quite a bit. And then that made them not as fun to watch. They uh, don't create as much because the structure is so it, it's so rigid. Every, everyone is into set positions, set roles. This is what you must do. And he barks constantly on the sidelines, always shouting at players, go, 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 this, 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 this. And they can actually hear him now. There's no fans in the crowd. And it seems very like there's not an awful lot of room to think. So if that works and they don't concede goals, like the Man United game is a good example, awful to watch. They didn't do anything, got their penalty and got three points. So you, you think it works. But all they were doing was successfully blocking out everything Man United were trying, I would say. Mm. I mean, people will say that, see the opposite, I'm sure. But to me, it's just blocking the team out, killing the game, controlling it, just controlling every single variable that is possible. Now, once the players have got this defensive side mastered, you can probably start to develop it. And the signing of Thomas Party, it's players that allow you to do different things, might mean he can do something different. And I think he's tried it already. I think he's played the, the 4-3-3 with that, which is what you'd imagine he'd be going for as an ex-Barcelona player and Pep Guardiola graduate, if we call him that. Yeah. And, and that's what you think will go going forward. But you need to... It takes so long for that to come in. And I just don't know he has the players to play how he wants. Like, he's playing in Ketty ahead of Lacazette for so long because he could press better. Mm. And he's playing Aubameyang, best central striker, one of the best central strikers in the league. Why? When he doesn't get touches in the box because it just suits the system. Yeah, it's an interesting thing about confidence, isn't it? Because I, I, we've we've done a video that will come out possibly next week, I think, on um, De Zerbi's Sassuolo. And I spoke to James Horncastle about it before doing the video. And... One of the points he was making is that De Zerbi comes in for quite a lot of criticism. His sides are quite defensively open and they're very intricate. And there's there's a sense that maybe, you know, he creates systems of play that are designed to make himself look good as much as anything. <laughs> but the corollary to that is that the players play with a great deal of freedom and confidence and they can try these intricate moves. And, and Sassuolo are a, a joy to watch. And the more those things come off, 
And we're not talking about a squad that's, you know, full of superstars here. I mean, Manuel Locatelli is a very, very good player, but, you know, it's it's not it's not a, a squad of household names. Mm-hmm. But but as the players develop technically and and play with more confidence and these things come off, they get better at doing them. And I sometimes worry that this this emphasis on on defensiveness, particularly from teams where you would, you know, you might expect that I, I don't know an Aston Villa, for example, or or even somebody like Brighton would would concentrate on that side of things to minimise risk. But surely Arsenal should be trying to be more expansive that you know they shouldn't be predicating a system on on defense and solidity first blocking first and then we'll see what happens that's that's quite discouraging if you're not just an arsenal fan but possibly also as an arsenal player because if he does make it more progressive then it makes them in theory more vulnerable to people scoring against them so like it's definitely I often I think Arsenal is <laughs> is kind of a team of really good five aside players that does not necessarily make them a good team. So like whenever you play five aside with players, I always notice that the guys who like to dribble, the guys with the maybe the best technical skills, are often not the ones who win because they're often not in the right position. They're not they don't have the right balance in play. They don't uh, they're not back into the defensive shape quickly enough. But teams with if you've got a team full of players who maybe aren't quite as technical, they're not. Nicholas Pepe, they don't, they, they can't dribble past two men at once and then ping one in the top corner, but they've got it. Hard work sounds like the most basic thing to say, but if you've got players who are just desperate to win, who will just chase that man down, even though there's no point in chasing the ball thirty yards away, they will still do it. Like Sadio Mane at Liverpool, I mean, he's amazing. He'll he'll just chase everyone, no matter like he'll chase a what someone once said to me, he'll chase a Chris Packet in a car park, just like just hunt it down, get it wins the ball and even if he doesn't win the ball it inspires those around them to do more and it's that levels like if Liverpool drop their level 5% they're not the same team and you have to have that kind of intensity and that mentality and Arsenal often come out in the second half and they're better because they've been maybe talked up or something like that they don't really go into it with the right uh, it's hard It's hard to say but if you I mean the way Conte had his team they were so quick in transition they were most dangerous in transition that's when they were Really, like, just really, really hard to play against because you could, couldn't break them down because they were very well organised, well drilled. Had a player like Hazard who can create out of nowhere, but basically only really him, <laughs> which isn't the worst thing to have. It's not built around him, but you've got a player who can just do those things when you need him to. And then everyone else is doing the work that they have to be able to do. It's very difficult to get the diff- the balance between the right system and having the right players in. Like on paper, Obama Yang, William, Thomas Partey, uh, Ceballos, Tierney, they're all really good players. But there's something about it that Arsenal just aren't as good as other teams. You look at that in the Premier League especially, there's that kind of list from about 5th place to about 13th and they're all the same. They're all the same team, the same game every week, more or less. Until you get down to the very bottom where teams have to be defensive. And then, like Newcastle did it so well last season, was how they managed to... I don't know, they're trying, they're trying to be more progressive now this season. And when they do, they don't win games. <laughs> it's yes, the 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 five four one, uh, no five one four even, where they're playing Jeff Hendrick as kind of like a sole scuttling defensive midfielder and and lots of people ahead. I'm sure that there's a a very good reason for it on paper, but um, I'm not sure it's been all that successful so far. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Um, before we do that. Um, Just to remind you that uh, available on the Athletics Podcast Network uh, is also a range of other exciting football shows um, from Muddy Knees Media, including one I believe that JJ, you're on. Oh, you'd be referring to the Totally Scottish Football Show there. Uh, It's a lovely little podcast, but um, yeah, give it a wee listen. It it helps if you like Scottish football, I think, but um, we treat it with the respect it deserves and often doesn't get elsewhere. And we also do not focus on Rangers and Celtic because, uh, well, I for one don't care and don't want to have to talk about it. Um, And there's other teams. And you see, if you only focus on two teams in the league, the league is damaged as a result. So listen to the Totally Scottish Football Show. (laughs) Welcome back to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm talking to JJ Bull. So when we were discussing things that we might talk about on on this podcast, um, you posited, does everyone have to play 
depressing high tempo football now or get written off as rubbish now it's interesting because my my own team southampton uh, are currently doing surprisingly well i think it would be fair to say playing playing that sort of style uh, obviously leads have come up and and been certainly entertaining to watch if slightly inconsistent in results but yes do you think there's do you think there's such a move towards that kind of football that that things become reductive and and difficult to find points of difference we talk about football being cyclical and we're talking about tactical trends it seems that everyone believes not everyone but there's this there seems to be a consensus among lots of football fans that you have to play a high pressing game or else you're just not doing it right like liverpool so jürgen klopp's come along playing a really aggressive uh, gegenpress, press whatever you want to call it but you've got all these players pushing all over the pitch and close everyone down it's relentless full of energy it requires super fit footballers which you know everyone is nowadays and that's the only way to play but it isn't there is there are far more ways to set up your team and tactics don't often I mean they're important but I wouldn't say they're the most important part in a in a game I mean it's, the players decide what happens on the pitch he players the right mentality, the right work rate. Sound really Graham Sooness here, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's dead true. And the more and more and more I read about football, and the more I like talk to people and get involved with coaching stuff, the more I think it doesn't matter what. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't matter what system you play if the players don't turn up. That's kind of obvious. But you could have, I mean, Guardiola had players at, at Barcelona that were. I mean, he came with, through with a, an amazing crop of players. You had. You do go through them, but you get Xavi and Iniesta and Puyol and Messi and blah, 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 blah. And he made them the best they could possibly be because the system he built uh, adhered to the Barcelona principles, the kind of Cruyffian things he puts into all his teams. They pressed high, they were re- relentless, and they played amazing football. But then he goes to different teams, different players. He has to do it slightly differently. And the current, the current kind of thing in football just now that things are it's a horrible word to use but i'm going to go with it it's all about i think a lot of teams are about physicality and energy and relentless press and the kind of german model it's really really energetic and quick transitions and um, that what jürgen klopp's applied to liverpool it's quite uh english football is very very physical people seem to really appreciate the physical side of things in english football and so you've got a team who can just go at them and they do them in with hard work people like them you know you watch sunday league and you'll get applauded for a slight tackle as much as you would a, a, a safe pass along the defence to a teammate. In fact, you get booed for that. Get rid! <laughs> so uh, I'm sort of dancing around my point that I'm trying to get to, but I'll get there in a minute if you remind me what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I suppose my, my question to the... And I, I don't disagree with you. Um, I, I wonder to what degree this is a result of... Certainly Pep's Barcelona, um, but also, you know, Klopp's Borussia Dortmund crashing in to to the to sort of Bayern hegemony mm-hmm. and, and also reaching the Champions League final with that very young and exhilarating team with, with players like Royce in it, for example. Whether stylistically some of these changes occur because the managers to whom those styles are attached, and you could chuck Bielsa into this mix as well, are attractive and engaging characters who are, whether consciously or not, very good at putting forward the idea of of their style of management as a concept or a philosophy, that you can attach a narrative to it that therefore, and obviously success if, if, if it's done well, that then you kind of get carried along by that and expectations fan expectations club owner expectations get carried along by that it's not we say i own a football club it's not necessarily that i recognize that pressing is the most successful way of playing football but in my mind i kind of think well actually i'd really like it if my manager was the next jürgen klopp or the next pep guardiola so i'm going out and finding managers because they play a certain style of football, because I want to emulate something else. Yeah. There is also something, I need to make sure I stay on my point here, but there's something about managers almost being um, attractive. 
where they can <laughs> they can present a that kind of philosophy and because that's the thing you're supposed to do that's the cool thing that everyone goes along with it but if they're a slightly unattractive person not are we talking literally we, how they look i think right. honestly the way they look affects people honestly well, I, I mean i gen- this is something i think that we touched on a, a couple of podcasts back but i i really think that particularly with guardiola also with klopp to an extent that actually the the because they are attractive and charismatic people they're cool they're cool yeah Yeah. and so and so the way that they package themselves up and i and i don't want to imply that this is in any way feigned for example Uh, it may be a result of a completely genuine being out there as they are but but i do think that it really lends something to particular styles of football when the adherence of that style can point to somebody who is charismatic and intelligent and really good at, at, at promulgating their philosophy articulately and and talking about it in a certain kind of way that makes it attractive as well. Or, or you have like the, the Bielsa mystique approach instead. But I, I think there's definitely something in that. Yeah, I think in Bielsa almost, almost comes, up, comes under a fun, wacky uncle. So you can like him for a different way. Yeah. If a football team is the, not the avatar of, but the, you know, how a manager wants, it's it's how the manager wants a team to look. It's in his image. So you look at Jurgen Klopp, Liverpool are like him, kind of loud, aggressive, kind of a bit off kilter. All those things that are Klopp are there. Guardiola, manic, obsessive, um, artistic, that kind of stuff is there. Diego Simeone, Atletico Madrid. How does he get away with playing that awful football? It's <laughs> horrible. <laughs> Yeah, everyone's like, oh, he's amazing. Because he, he knows how to make a team like horribly dirty, uh, really hard to break down and determined to win. And he identifies players who fit into that and then he assigns really good players. They're basically a really good version of like Burnley. Yeah. If that, and that's it, right? So, but who do you think is held in higher regard? Diego Simeone or Sean Dice? Simeone, he's much cooler and he's doing it at a bigger club. But that's kind of... Th- I think the two things are sort of linked. And I think it feeds into um, the anti Ole Gunnar Solskjaer narrative. Everyone seems to think he's useless, right? And they say, I often see people saying, oh, he, he's just no good. He's no good as a manager. And I don't know what that means because he is at a massive, a massive club here, right? He's got all these players that haven't been performing well for uh, Josie Mourinho, one of the greatest managers of all time, and who uh, Louis van Gaal didn't get an awful lot out of. It's at the end of a dynasty with Alex Ferguson retiring. A whole bunch of changes with, uh, behind the scenes with their director of football, that kind of stuff going on. Not director of football. Uh, Ed Woodward and David Gill, that, that bit's piece is going on. But you see from game to game, United don't necessarily stick to one philosophy, one strict thing. They don't always have to do a relentless high press and they change shape quite a lot. You know, they've done a 3-4-1-2, they have 4-2-3-1, 4-3-3. A few different uh, shapes, different systems. The principles, are, I'd imagine, are the same. They want to attack when they can, but Solskjaer doesn't mind sitting deeper and counter-attacking, and it often tends to be when they win is when they have less of the ball because they have players that are best at that, so it suits the players. A good manager picks the right system for the players available. Man United's best style of play would be counter-attacking, so you have to do that. But if you're a Man United manager, you have to have more of the ball because that naturally happens. Mm. Now, Man United finished, was it third last season? Did really well. Um, Solskjaer just isn't cool he isn't cool at all he doesn't seem cool when he does his, his press conferences he seems quite nerdy kind of a guy that you know, you're not desperate to hang out with him you want to hang out with Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp you want to go for a beer with them you know, and have a nice little chat but uh, Solskjaer uh, oh, whatever you'd invite him around he'd invite you into his house for like I don't know a sandwich and then you'd be there for too long it's like when you go around to your <laughs> to, uh, your parents friends at Christmas you know this is so boring that would be what it's like. But now you've got fans who think that Mauricio Pochettino is the only solution for Man United. He should go in because he plays this modern style, this high-pressing game of Spurs, which he put in when he went into Spurs. But Pochettino did it because he had the players. He also had that guy, the head of recruitment guy who was there at the time. He's now at Leipzig, I think. Paul Mitchell. Paul Mitchell, that's the one. So I think a lot of it, when I was saying that it's not just all about tactics, I think most of football management is recruitment. And mm. it... The players that Pochettino had at Spurs allowed him to play that certain style because they were recruited to do it. He also 
had a player like Harry Kane come through it was at the right time but by the time Pochettino left Spurs were dreadful to watch they didn't play with that same sort of press and also it wasn't even that much of a high press at Spurs I think they blocked the middle most of the time and then just fouled people to stop them being able to counter-attack against them that was basically it what I saw the last games I saw Spurs play before Pochettino went they had no width they had no pace they had very little invention and it just wasn't very very good and that was a team he had built that that was his team so you put someone like Pochettino in who is cool and he's I think you know he looks like a cool guy he was great on Monday Night Football the other day and suddenly that's going to change things at Man United I don't know but that's the trendy thing is there not also an issue and and I I I don't disagree with a lot of what you've said um you know I think it's it's one of the reasons why Ralph Hasenhutl for example gets as many plaudits as he does compared with for example Graham Potter I'm not saying one yeah. is necessarily better than the other but one is very reminiscent of Jurgen Klopp and the other is very reminiscent of a substitute geography teacher and so <laughs> and I say that with all due respect to Graham Potter because I think he's a brilliant manager but that's kind of the point you know that unless there's unless there's something to hang the narrative off then it 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 does become harder to generate interest I suppose that the other thing I'd say about Solskjaer though is a kind of counterpoint to what you're saying although in a way also possibly something you might agree with is that the flexibility that Solskjaer brings and and I agree you know there's there's been some fantastic performances particularly when he's able to to counterattack but he you know he will set the team up very intelligently for certain games um but it doesn't show necessarily somebody who seems to have a firm grip on a particular philosophy now is that because fans misunderstand the idea of philosophy and associate it with shape or is it that actually they're kind of that it, that that those changes are being forced on them because as you as you say you know if you've got rashford and and martial particularly and also mason greenwood you know you are well suited to counter-attacking football but if you're manchester united there will be plenty of games where you're expected to break down a team that's that's sitting deep and so it's not possible to set up a philosophy because there's an inherent tension between what you are naturally good at and what is expected of you or is it that actually Solskjaer's philosophy is kind of you know it's to get the ball forwards quickly and to exploit pace and to use young players to do that but it just doesn't work in a lot of games Um, and so it seems like you know there isn't one I wonder all of the same things Right. Okay. Well, that's helpful. <laughs> Would you like to provide our listeners with an answer? Yes. Because <laughs> it seems like there's a fetish for philosophy, right? And I yeah. and I I say that as somebody who who kind of puts that forwards anyway. And and I get a real pleasure from watching Southampton and being able to see very very clearly game to game what is happening and why. If you look at managers like Carlo Ancelotti, who I mean his entire career he's, he's not had one set system that he's ever stuck to he's always changed he's always adapted uh quite flexible but more like during the season he'll often stick to one kind of system do you know so like the his ac milan 4-3-2-1 he used to play that was what they played but then he would have uh 4-4-2 at a different team and he would have well, he's got a 4-3-3 now at everton and uh i th- it might harm the team changing every single week I wonder what that's like if you've got different shapes coming on I think I agree with you that the problem might be perceived that Solskjaer doesn't seem to have a grip on what his best team is but then maybe the best team isn't just one team every single week like Liverpool are especially if they haven't got the players for it it's adapting to your opponent but yeah, that may also I, be I, a weakness I suppose my, my issue with that on Solskjaer is that the the predominant differences are in midfield and there is such an enormous difference be- between playing a double pivot of McTominay and Fred versus playing a double pivot of Pogba plus somebody or a three involving Van der Beek. You know, it's yes. not, it doesn't seem like it's just a product of circumstance. Like, it's so different that, you know, if you're Liverpool, 
you want to play Fabinho plus Henderson plus one other. And whether it's Wijnaldum or Naby Keita, for example, will allow you to do slightly different things. But fundamentally, you're putting out the same midfield. It's just either slightly more dynamic or slightly less dynamic. But you can't say that about what Manchester United are doing. They're trying to get the most out of a player like Paul Pogba, who seems to be the problem. And they've got Bruno Fernandes, who wants to really be a 10, and you can't not play him. And that's the position he has to be in. So you've got to find a system that works with that. And the only real ones you've got or a 4 2 3 one, or some sort of midfield diamond. And the diamond isn't really a system that I've seen work for a long time because you don't really have players who are... It's not really a lot of teams that play a 10 anymore. So you're almost... By getting Fernandez in, you're kind of limiting yourself to what to how you can play. And if the other team can block that out, then the whole point of building the system around that player is negated. <laughs> it does seem like a weird throwback because it is, I, yes, I it was Arsenal, you're right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, Fernandez has unquestionably been really productive for Manchester United and and as a, a a transformational signing in the second half of last season was was arguably the most such player in the Premier League. But at the same time, it does massively constrain them because aside from a few instances at Sporting where he would play considerably deeper but at the same time you know that that was a, a league of, of a different level of quality and he was very very much the man at that club so he could kind of do what he liked mm. it's it's just not a position that that crops up an awful lot now and it really does seem to to constrain you know Solskjaer has got an undoubtedly very talented player on his hands but by persisting with selecting him which is really the only logical thing he can do he is also shoehorning the rest of the team into like you say really one of two potentially three shapes i mean you can you can see it with a sort of three four one two but again people don't really tend to use that very much it 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 seems it seems odd i guess it goes back to that point you were making about the fact that this is this is as much an issue around recruitment and and squad building and structuring as it is what you actually then manifest on the pitch yeah it's very complicated and and as well to I mean the players make the difference as well within that system so if you've got Fernandez, you really have to play probably McTominay and Fred to get a bit of uh, bustling energy f- further back and someone you can keep the ball so there's no room for Pogba which is a giant problem for them I mean there, there's probably an entire podcast dedicated just to Paul Pogba who is <laughs> a fantastic player like he's lovely to watch but I wonder whether you want him in your five-a-side team. Like, this is my theory with Man United, right? A, a five-a-side team of Pogba, um, Fernandez, Cavani, uh, Martial, and uh, we'll put De Gea in, right, as goalkeeper, would probably lose against one of... Um, <laughs> Henderson, Wijnaldum, Henderson. Fabinho, Van Dijk. I was going to go inside... And I was going to go inside Man United squad and have oh, McT- right. McTominay, um, Rashford, uh, all the boys who who work really hard. Yeah, they were the ones who would win that game. Yeah, I've maintained for quite some time, ever since we did a video on him, that that Fred is massively underappreciated. To an extent, yes. I think it was interesting. Troy Deeney was on. I think it was one of the talk sports, something like that, and he was saying how Watford were ready. They, they based their press on him because he takes about three or four touches to get the ball under control. So whenever the ball went to him, they would they would close him down. And you do see it. He doesn't kill it dead often with one touch. Mm. It takes a couple, but he gets away with it. I think he's decent. He's just a different kind of player, and that affects how the system works. You see it. I mean, like, touching back on our... to almost a callback to the start when we're talking about three-man defensive systems, like Aberdeen fans... I would support Aberdeen and follow Scottish football as we do in the Totally Scottish Football Show... Aberdeen fans expect Aberdeen to play almost like they did under Sir Alex Ferguson, which is also relevant to this Man United part, uh, where the team attacks and they're they're really hard to beat and they're just amazing. They win every single game, like when they beat Real Madrid in 1983. Really hard to ever get back to that sort of thing now. Derek McInnes is the current manager, gets a lot of stick from Aberdeen fans who uh, think that Aberdeen should be playing in a similar way to how they played in the 80s, which you can't really do, it's different players. Um, and what had basically I've wanted him sacked for a while because the football's been terrible. But over one summer window, 
where he's managed to bring in a lot of players that can play the way he wants to now play, having have to rebuild every single year. It's really, it's quite good to watch with the same system. Mm. So the same system that didn't work last year, it was often used, just did, did not work with different players in it, now suddenly does. And McInnes is uh, uh, saved. <laughs> he's like a new manager. But that's, I mean, I guess that's that's one of the reasons why why transfers or transfer windows attract so much interest and you know we do the sensible transfer series on on tifo that it's yes, it's, it's as good. much oh that's very kind of you um it it is that thing of thinking not just you know again going back to football manager which has has just come out and i've i've been pottering it's open around. on my screen right now yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh it's terrible well terrible in the sense that it's terribly addictive um but it is that that thing of you you don't if you're sensible you do not go out and simply buy the three or four best players in the world because it might look great on paper or in a nike advert but it's not the way to construct a team and and you have to and I guess you know to to sort of bring it full circle. This this is this is why perhaps people like um, you know Bielsa in terms of his first season at Leeds, or there, there was some player development there. But he needed to bring a few people in or bring people up to speed. Hassan Hootel has started this season much much better, having brought in a couple of players that that were what he wanted. You know, and he's had the time to coach them, and it takes time. To exactly, get that to work. It, it takes it takes a balance of of time and an appropriate number of signings. You can't also bring in eleven new players, you know, because then you don't have the cohesion, and it takes too long. But managers managers need to have the time to be able to implement those ideas. Uh, I agree, and they need to have the support behind the scenes to. To not necessarily be pushed into signing an extraordinarily productive Portuguese number ten, who will nonetheless prevent them from playing more than one or two different systems. Um, and I mean, uh, I mean, on that on that note, if you look at um, if Hassan Hull, who I think should be at one of the top clubs in the league, not that he Southampton is. aren't. Yeah. He is. <laughs> I saw that coming as soon as I said it. Yeah. Uh, but see, if he were to, we'll try and bring it full circle if he were to be in charge of Arsenal they would play the way Southampton do be much more fun to watch and I think would would probably be better but they might end up with the same results that they're getting now and were Arteta to be at Southampton and playing the way that Arsenal are playing they might very well have managed to squeeze out the same results that Hassan Hutler has got at the start of the season and so it, was, it would seem like Arteta's got the right idea because he's higher up the table than Hassan Hutler, even though both systems work in their own way mm. so so kind of what you're saying is that that really managers are pointless because yes. you can you can swap <laughs> them in and out and uh yeah uh, but if but if they're handsome and charismatic then we'll follow them anyway you want to follow them into battle and you want to follow uh yeah it's something about that because as a as a fan you want your manager to be cool i think you want to be your manager to be someone who you can look up to even though you might be older than some of them. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you want um, they want them to represent what you feel about the club and how you... And they have a lot of that. I mean, in a way, they are the sort of avatar for the club, you know, the manager, because they're, it's their face that appears alongside the team sheet or the club badge when you're looking at certain teams. So they don't represent the values you think they should and they don't play the way that you think that team should. Mm. It affects your opinion of them. Yeah. Well, they are they are the probably the key determinant for how a brand the brand of the football club is perceived don't they yeah um and so there's a crushing indictment of the capitalization of football what a happy note to end on um thank you very much for joining us jj or joining us joining me well thanks only me but i say us in the sense of of the listeners as well um, right. Well, that uh, just leaves me to say then, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, tuning in to the TIFO Football Podcast. Uh, we will be back next week. Um, I, I suspect the cohort will be bolstered. Joe probably should be around. Seb is likely back from holiday. Uh, and we'll be talking about something that is not this thing that we've just been talking about, but is probably tangentially related. 